We all know that the human being is limited. The being is flawed. The human being at his or her best, his ability, whether that's physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, is always kept at best. That is when you're at best, let alone when you're at your worst. Or things are average or mediocre. So no matter what we strive and attempt to do, something is going to be Inshallah. So with that being said, um, as it was mentioned by my brother, may Allah bless him and increase him in good. The time is late. However, my personal comfort or my personal uh, enjoyment or pleasure or how I'm feeling, etc. And I'm not saying this to stand in front of you to look like I'm someone pious or righteous or something that I'm not better than what I actually am. But it is the reality is that my comfort is not what's important. What's important is that we've come here for a purpose. And inshallah ta'ala, we're gonna treat it as such. With regards to the talk, with regards to questions, with regards to answers, we're gonna do the best that we can. How I'm feeling and what time it is, it doesn't matter. Alhamdulillah, if we wanted sleep and rest, we'll be in the United States. And I remember once we were in Guyana, and um, it was the first talk that we did of the, of the tour. And our brothers were asking questions, people were benefiting. It was after Salat al Isha, and it was in the summertime as well, it was late. So our brother, he said, the Sheikh is tired, the Sheikh has to rest, the Sheikh needs to get some sleep. So one of the young Guyanese brothers, he said there, he says, the Sheikh can rest in the Qabristan. <laughs> he said, the Sheikh can rest in the grave. Meaning, he didn't come to Guyana to sit back and, you know, drink coconut water. He came to Guyana for a purpose. And the same applies to coming to the United Kingdom. We came here for a purpose, what Allah had hummed. And uh, I humbly believe, and Allah surely knows best, is that we've tried our best to fulfill that purpose. Of course, there are bumps in the road. Of course, there are challenges. Of course, there are obstacles. Of course, there are many, many, many things behind the scenes. Wallahu ghalibun ala amrihi. But Allah Azza wa Jal is the one who's going to. Uh, He's going to be in control no matter what. Allah is going to win. And those on the side of Allah's Father, they will win. Even if the people will try to stop that. And we ask Allah to make us of those who win. And to make us of those who are on the side of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger. And the side of the believers. I mean. So with that being said, inshallah ta'ala, we'll give you some words of wisdom. It's something that I wanted to read to you. Something which is very profound and beneficial for myself. And I don't feel that I would be a good brother and an honest Muslim if I didn't share those words with you. Okay? Because the Prophet tells us that you can't be a believer until you love for your brother that which you love for yourself. If the brothers have any comments afterwards, or if you have any questions on the topic or after the, or off of the topic, then I'm willing to sit here. It doesn't matter to me, be the night ta'ala. We came home for a purpose, so don't worry, inshallah. Don't worry. Khairin inshallah. Last time I came to the United Kingdom. I did a khutbah, uh, just like I did a khutbah this time, but last time I think it was a Green Lane Mosque, a Green Lane Masjid, and I did a khutbah on a, a topic that I feel is very widespread, a topic that I feel is something that most of us suffer from, a topic that I feel all of us have been affected by and from, on one level or another, and a topic that a wise man who wasn't a Muslim said, out of all character defects and flaws, and all of the problems that people have in their minds and in their hearts and their souls, 
is one of them that they will never ever acknowledge and they'll never admit to and they'll never suck up to. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Also, last but not least, the last thing I'll say before I read these beautiful words is the concept of one of the reasons why we have so many fights and disagreements and arguments. One of the reasons why we are in the situation that we're in with regards to masjids and centers and imams and students of knowledge and scholars. Qala Abu Abbas rahimahullah ta'ala Inna al-hasada maradun min amrad al-nafs Wuhu maradun ghalibun Fala yakhlusu minhu illa qalilu min al-nas Walihada yuqalu ma khala jasadun min hasad Lakin al-la'im yubdihi wal-kirim yukhfihi وقد قيل لحسن البصري أيحسد المؤمن فقال ما أنساك إخوة يوسف إلا أو لا أبا لك ولكن عمه في صدرك فإنه لا يدرك ما لم تعديه يدا أو لسانا فمن وجد في نفسه حسدا لغيره فعليه أن يستعمل معه التقوى والصبر فيكره ذلك من نفسه شيخ الإسلام ابن تيمية may Allah have mercy upon him was one of the most influential Islamic figures in the annals of history and one of the most talented human beings known to the world. Uh, he was a person that was so talented, so skilled, so knowledgeable and so learned that whenever he spoke about a subject or talked about something, the onlookers, the audience, the people in the crowd, they thought that that was the only thing that he had ever studied in his life. That's the only thing that he knows is what he's talking about right now because of his utter mastery of that subject. Just stop and think about this now. For someone to be so good at a thing that you say it's impossible for this man to have time to do and study and review anything else. And in most cases, when he talked about that thing, it wasn't even his field of expertise or it wasn't his favorite thing to do or his favorite subject to discuss. Shaykh Hussain ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah was known to each and every one of you. I have to give you a lecture about Shaykh Islam. When he would debate with people, and people lied on him, and people went to the ruler, they went to the Sultan, and he said he's this, and he said he's that. He says Allah is like this, and Allah is like that, and he lied on him. All right? He made up things about Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah. He would say to the ruler, and the thing which would equalize the playing field, because there were more, there were, there, there were more people than him. And they had political influence and political power. And he would say to the ruler, he said, this is what I believe with regards to Allah's names and attributes. This is what I believe with regards to visiting the graves. This is what I believe with regards to swearing by Allah and Allah, etc. The points of difference between me and between them. And he would say to the ruler, this was his key weapon, he would say, فَكُلُّ مَنْ خَالَفَنِي فَأَنَا أَعْلَمُ بِمَذْهَبِهِ مِنْهُ he says, all of these people who have won against me, I know their madhabs better than they do. All of the people who have problems with me, whether they're lying or whether I'm telling the truth, whatever, I know what Shafi'i said more than they do, and they claim to be Shafi'i scholars. And I know the text of Imam Malik more than those who are Maliki scholars do. And it takes a lot to make a statement like that. That's a bold claim. That's a bold claim. And we know one of the most effective ways of using a ruse when you're fighting someone is a bluff. A well-timed bluff. I dare you to do it. And in most cases, if a person is scared, or if they flinch, or they're a little hesitant, or they're a little uh, timid, the bluff will work. But oftentimes, the bluff doesn't work. And you'll find yourself in a world of trouble if they say, all right, let's go. you find yourself in a world of trouble. So to make a bluff, proves a certain amount of courage. <clears throat> to make a bluff and to stand to that bluff and say, I know what you're supposed to be on more than you do. That's to prove a great deal of confidence. And we know that can't come from unless you have a great deal of talent and skill and you've devoted a large part of your life to reading and studying. That was Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah who felt that he was invincible. He claimed that he was invincible. You may say, what do you mean? When did he say that he was invincible? He said that famous statement, He says, what can my enemies do to me? What can they do to me? If they lock me up, if they kill me, if they arrest me, if they do this to me, he says, how can they beat me? If they put me in prison, then I get a break from teaching people. 
and I can make the dhikr and the salah and the ibadah that I want to make. He says, if they take my life, then I'll be a martyr. If they remove me from Syria or from Egypt, he says, then I get a vacation. They can't win. It takes a great deal of skill and talent and confidence to make statements like that. So Shaykh Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahu ta'ala wa ta'ala was one of the greatest scholars of our Islam, if not the greatest scholar of our Islam. So Shaykh Islam Taymiyyah is one of my favorite authors, even though I'm a bit more biased, and I lean more towards Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahu Allah. And those who watch our lessons and our videos, they know how often we quote Ibn al-Qayyim. How often we read from the works of Ibn al-Qayyim, but it doesn't mean that we don't have a very, very, very strong love and fondness for Shaykh al-Islam ibn al-Taymiyyah, his teacher. And before I read these words, there's only a few words, there's a very interesting story with regards to Ibn al-Taymiyyah and with regards to Ibn al-Qayyim, how they met, what Ibn al-Qayyim used to be before he met Ibn Taymiyyah, how Ibn Taymiyyah was patient with Ibn al-Qayyim, and how he sat with him and discussed things with him, and how he allowed Ibn al-Qayyim to bring everything that he had and to stand on his position until Allah Azza guided Ibn al-Qayyim to the correct sunnah. Very interesting story, I'm not going to tell you. If you get a chance, read how Ibn al-Qayyim and Taymiyyah met up. And what Ibn al-Qayyim was before he met Ibn Taymiyyah and what he became afterwards. And read about the hardships and the difficulties and the struggles that they both went through. And anyone who reads their books is forced to respect them. You may not agree with them, but you're going to respect them. Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala, I would say he's a scholastic bully. A scholastic bully. When you read his position, he's going to bombard you with his proofs, with his evidences, with his intellectual reasoning. So much so that you'll doubt yourself on the issue that you're reading in his book. Read Tahdib al-Sunan. Simple example of this, of Tulaq al-Bid'ah. Can you divorce a woman who's menstruating? Or divorce a woman who you just had intercourse with? What is the ruling on Tulaq al-Bid'ah? When you study the books of Fiqh, you find 99% of the ulama of Islam all saying that talaq al-bid'ah yaqa. Even though it's haram and it's impermissible, it's counted as a divorce. It is counted as a divorce. And you'll be, as they say, hard-pressed to find an island who said that it doesn't count. But Ibn Taymiyyah, and especially Ibn Qayyim, when you read their argument, there lies no doubt. If you're not firm on your view and your position, you only may come across a few pages before you may say, whoa, wait a second. This is a little dangerous now. So Ibn, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah in his book Tathib al-Sunan, he discusses the issue of talaq al bid'ah for Allahu alam how many pages in depth like no other alim. And he used the knowledge that Allah gave him. And he used it in a very powerful way. So before I read these words, my personal uh, advice is for any student of knowledge or any layman Muslim, <coughs> who wants the highest of the high, the most pure huh, version of ilm, is to read the books of those two scholars. Ibn Taymiyyah, Ibn Qayyim, whether it's in English, and even, uh, whether it's in Arabic and even in English. So Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, he speaks about this problem that we all suffer from, that we've been affected by, there's the main reason behind all of the bickering and the fighting in the United Kingdom and outside of the United Kingdom. He said that Hasad, whether you translate it to be envy or jealousy, maradun min amradin nafs. He says it's a disease and it's an illness of the soul. It's a disease and an illness of the soul to have hasad. And it's something that most people suffer from. It's a disease which isn't rare or unique. It's not a disease of old people. It's a disease that most people have. فَلَا يَخْلُصُ مِنْهُ إِلَّا قَلِيلٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ Only a few men can actually say that they have no hasid whatsoever. Most people they have it, according to Ibn Taymiyyah. And for this reason it was said, people used to say, مَا خَلَى جَسَدٌ مِنْ حَسَدٌ Nobody is free from hasid, from envy and from jealousy. No. لَكِنَّ الْإِمْ يُبْدِهِ But the wretch, the low person, the base person, the man who isn't noble, who isn't enlightened, yubdihi, he manifests his hasid through his statements, through his actions, through his akhlaq, through his facial expressions. He can't hide it because he isn't noble. He's not enlightened. He's too low to stifle it and to suppress it. What kareem yukhvihi, and the noble man, the enlightened one, the high one, 
he yukhfihi. He hides it and he stifles it. He doesn't allow it to be spewed out. وَقَدْ قِيلَ لِلْحَسْنَ الْبَصْرِ Hasan al-Basri, he was asked once, أَيَحْسُدُ mumin Can a believer have hasid? Is it possible for there to be one who is a mu'min to have hasid? مَا أَنْسَاكَ إِخْوَةُ Yusuf, لَا أَبَنْ لَكَ He says, haven't you read the story of Yusuf and his brothers? May you have no father. He says, may you have no father. Did you not read the Qur'an on Kareem and his brothers? They all had what? They had hasid and they were believers. Shaykh Sam Tamir rahimahullah, he didn't quote Hassan al-Basri by saying, وَلَكِنْ عَمِّهِ فِي صَدْرِكَ He says, stuff it and lock it up in your chest. Don't let it come out. Don't let it be manifested. فَإِنَّهُ لَا يَدُرُّكَ مَا لَمْ تُعَدِّهِ يَدًا وَلِسَانًا He says, because you won't be taken into account, you won't be punished, nothing will happen to you as long as it doesn't extend to your hand or your tongue. As long as you don't speak about it, or do something physically with your hands. Shaykh al-Islam rahimahullah he says, فَمَنْ وَجَدَ فِي نَفْسِهِ حَسِدًا لِعَيْدِهِ فَعَلَيْهِ أَنْ يَسْتَعْمِنَ مَعَهُ التَّقْوَى وَالصَّبُرُ فَيَقْرَهُ ذَلِكَ مِنْ نَفْسِهِ He says, whoever finds himself to be jealous or envious, which is natural, it can happen. It's not something which is impossible. It's not something which is far-fetched. He says, then he has to cure this hasid and fight this hasid and extinguishes hasid with taqwa and with sabr. And he has to hate that thing. He cannot allow that thing to dominate himself. He cannot allow that thing to come out in his statements, in his actions, his facial expressions, and also in his scholarship. You cannot say things and determine things and come to conclusions, come to reservations, have opinions, make statements about people that is based off of hasid. So last year in the Green Lane Mosque, I did this khutbah, not with this speech, but I surrounded this, uh, my khutbah around the hadith of Abdullah bin Mas'ud, and that's why he hanged. I wish the Messenger of Allah, alayhi salatu wasalam, he said, La hasada illa fithnataini. He says, there's no hasad. There's not to be no hasad except for one or two circumstances. And he mentioned from these two circumstances, Rajulun atahu Allahul hikmah. Is that a man whom Allah gives wisdom, he has knowledge, he's learned. And another version, atahu Allahul Quran, he's learned of the Quran. And he teaches the people this wisdom. He makes judgment based off of wisdom, and he teaches people wisdom. And the second person whom you are allowed to have hasid for is Rajulun Atahullahu Malan. Is a man whom Allah has made very wealthy. He's given him a lot of money, but he's also made him to be extremely generous. And he spends all of his money in the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. These are the only two people whom you are allowed to have hasid against. And we quote it in this khutbah, what the ulama of Islam say what's meant by this hadith. It doesn't mean that you can be nasty to these people and say bad things about them and lie and make controversy. He says, no, it doesn't mean that. وَإِنَّمَا الْمَقْصُودَ الْغِبْطَةِ And al ghibta means if you say, man, I wish I had what he had. SubhanAllah, it's a beautiful brother. MashaAllah, he's so knowledgeable. He sold this, he sold that. I wish I had what he had. I wish I could do what he did. I wish Allah Azza wa would bless me similar to what he has blessed me or blessed him with. That is called ghibta. And hasad is when you hate for this brother to have it. Even if you yourself don't want it, or even if you're unworthy or if you're not qualified to do what he does. But I hate it so much, I don't want you to shine. And that is prohibited all of the time. And we quoted Shaykh Al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah Rahimah Ta'ala mentioning about al-hasad and how it is a disease and there were many people who had this disease of different religions, let alone the Muslims. And how a scholar and a learned person and a knowledgeable person could be afflicted with this disease. And I read this speech here of Shaykh Al-Islam Taymiyyah when I was on the airplane and I said I want to share this with one of the masters that I go to. And wallahi, when I was on the airplane, I was asking my companion, our brother, our elder, Abu Sa'id, what's the schedule? What talks am I doing in the UK? Well, I, I didn't know what talks I was doing until I had landed. And he said, they're doing all Ramadan talks. And then we spoke to Brother Noor, preparing for Ramadan, maximizing Ramadan, doing this Ramadan, everything around Ramadan, which is a good thing when I'm there. But this is one of the talks that I wanted to do because it was beneficial for myself. And it was also going to be a follow-up of last year of the concept of hasad. 
And we quoted Shaykh Islam saying that there are some people قَدْ يُبْتَلَى بَعْضُ الْمُنْتَسِبِينَ إِلَى الْعِلْمِ بِنَوْعٍ مِنَ الْحَسَدِ He says some people who are attributed to knowledge and ascribe themselves to him, they can be afflicted with chasid. And we quoted the famous iconic story of Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah, who was such a talented young man, he attracted chasid. And many people envied him. And from those who envied him, wasn't his peer, wasn't his classmate, wasn't his student, but it was his own teacher. Just stop and think about this now. The, your sheikh, your ustad is jealous of you. And not only is he jealous of you, and he has hatred because Allah gave you something that he didn't give him or it took you a year to learn it, it took him 20 years, but he made a campaign against Imam al-Bukhari. <coughs> and he basically slandered Imam al-Bukhari. And he made a great deal of huh, kalam about Imam al-Bukhari. So much so that they would boycott Imam al-Bukhari. And they thought bad things of him. And they kicked him out of Baghdad. And he went from one place to another, and he did not enjoy the honor of being Imam al-Bukhari, all because of his teacher's envy. And not from Lata Subul Amwat, Fainhum Qad Afdo ila Ma'amilu. Do not curse the dead, because they have done what they have done. Don't curse them, there's no need in cursing them. This is not included in that, in that hadith. Even though Imam al-Bukhari mentions in his book, Kitab al Janais, Babu Dhikri Shirar al Mutah. Imam al-Bukhari mentions in the book of funerals mentioning shirar al the evil from among the dead. And he quoted the first verse from Surah Al-Lahab. Al-Muhim, we're not here to curse any Muslims or to speak ill against any Muslims who passed away. But the truth is the truth. And that Imam was Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli, rahimahullah ta'ala. Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli was one of the most knowledgeable imams of hadith. He had mastered Ila al Ahadith al Zuhri. He was an expert of the Ila al Hadith, the hardest subgenre of the study of Hadith. Yet and still, he interviewed Imam al Bukhari. And he asked Imam al Bukhari questions, and he passed on news, and he passed on narrations and statements that Imam al Bukhari supposedly said, Lafdi bin Qurani makhluk. Supposedly attributed to Imam al Bukhari that when I recite the Quran, it's created. When I recite the Quran, my recitation of the Quran is created. Is that permissible to say? Is that valid? Is that correct to say? Is the Quran created? We know it's not. Are the deeds of the slaves created? We know they are. There's no doubt about that. The Kalam of Allah is not created. The actions of the slaves, including what they recite and how they recite is created. So he who answers that question is stuck between a rock and a hard place. If you say, Lafdi bin Qur'ani makhluq, when I recite the Quran, it's created. Someone may understand that you're saying that the Qur'an is what? Created. And if you say, Lafdi bin Qur'ani, Laysa bi makhluq, that's not created, one may say, you're denying the fact that the acts of the slaves are created. So it's a slippery slope, a troublesome issue. And they attached to Imam al-Bukhari, and they boycotted him, and they disrespected him. So much so, that the pupil at the time, and the friend of Imam al-Bukhari was Imam Muslim. Imam Muslim, he told Imam al-Dhuhdi, he gave him all of his hadiths which were more valuable than solid gold, to have a senate Ali of this great imam. He says, take all of your narrations. As long as you're against my friend and my teacher Bukhari, I don't want them anymore. And we know what happened to Imam Bukhari. al dhahbi rahimahullah, he mentions the story in Seer Alam al-Nubala, in his full version. And it's one of the most beneficial stories for the student of knowledge in 2019, to realize what I just read to you, is that it is a maradun min amrad al-nafs, what Ibn Taymiyyah just said is that it is a disease of the soul and it is something which is most people suffer from and only a few people are free from it. Even those who have knowledge, those who are righteous and those who have a great deal of ilm, they can be attributed or afflicted by what? By hasad. And what happens when you have hasad? It clouds your judgment. You can't see properly. And you start interpreting things the way you want to interpret them. You start looking at things the way you want to look at them. Or I start looking for things that I have no business looking for. And it's dangerous. So this is the khutbah that I did last year. And obviously it was a strategic khutbah. I did it for a purpose and for a reason. I did it for myself first and foremost. And I did it for one of the things that I saw was one of the main ingredients of this stew of fitna in the United Kingdom 
and in the United States and wherever you go. I don't think there's a country in which there are Muslims, in which there are students of knowledge, except that they have this fitna. And that is of the student talking about the teacher. That is of the friend now stabbing his friend in the back. That is of the masjids instead of working together, cooperating, helping each other out, trying to settle the differences with ilm, with respect, with sabr, they do the exact opposite. And oftentimes it's based off of hasid. The only reason why I looked for your mistakes is because I envied you. The only reason why I didn't make an excuse for you is because I envy you. The only reason why, and the list goes on of the problems of the soul, that we ask Allah to purify our souls. So with that being said, Hassan al-Basr rahimahullah, when he was asked, or before that part, Sheikh Sami says, there are two types of men in the world. There's the Kareem, and then there's the Naim. There is the one who's noble, and there's the one who is base and mean. So both of them could be afflicted with hasid. It can happen. But he stifles it. And this is an extremely important Islamic concept of fighting yourself and stifling certain feelings, thoughts, and emotions. And we live in a time in which people call themselves liberal or progressive or modern Muslims, and they don't understand this concept. A perfect example of this is the concept of a homosexual in Islam. Can a Muslim be a homosexual? Can a homosexual be a Muslim? Someone who's a lesbian, someone who is gay, someone who's queer, etc. What is the ruling on that in our Islam? It's a huge amount of controversy in the world today with regards to LGBTQ, etc. And the Muslims are not free from it. You can get on the television, you can go on YouTube, you can go on CNN or BBC or whatever, you can find someone who's a gay man. And he's openly gay. I'm a Muslim, I pray, I lead the people in the prayer, and I'm a homosexual. And there's no proof in the Quran or the Sunnah to prove that it's impermissible for me to be a homosexual. You can find someone saying that. And then you can find someone who's saying, who says, if you're gay, you're no longer a Muslim. You're a Catholic just by being a homosexual. Like what happened to us the other night. We were asked the question, can a Muslim be a homosexual? And we answered the question, is that homosexuality in Islam, according to the Quran and the Sunnah, is a major sin, an abomination. Min al kabain al muhlikat. There's no doubt about that. It's a major sin. It's a grave sin. But what proof do we have to say this person isn't a Muslim and that they are a kafir and they are a murtad? Do you have the deal to state that? If a person says it's permissible to be homosexual, there's nothing against it, so on and so forth, that's different. We're not talking about al mustahid. We're talking about the one who ya'atarif. He acknowledges the fact that it's wrong. He says, I know I'm wrong, it's messed up, but I was taken advantage of, or whatever the case may be, may Allah help me, I'm still a Muslim. So we answered the question, that's what we said. And after we did the lecture, a brother, he pulled me to the side, he said, Sheikh, Jazakallah khairan. He says, you were too soft on the homosexual question. He said, you were too soft. You were supposed to, you know, be harder on that. So what was I supposed to say? That he is a kafir? I have to have a proof for that. Am I qualified for that? What delay do you... Do you have to say that someone is a murtad just because they're homosexual? Is it haram? We're not different on that. Is it a major sin? Is it something which is against Islam? No one is different on that. But to say he isn't a Muslim, you have to have a delay for that. So you have people who are on both sides of extremism. Both sides of extremism. What's the point that I'm trying to get to? Abdullah ibn Abbas narrated that the Prophet said, in Sahih Bukhari, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu said, Allah curses men who imitate women. And He curses women who imitate men. Men who mutashabbih. Listen, it is a mushbihin. Mushabihin. He says mutashabbihin. And anyone who understands the Arabic language, he knows what that wasn't means, the fa'ala. Mutashabbih. He who tries to imitate a woman is cursed. And a woman who tries to imitate a man is cursed. These are the words of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This hadith by itself clearly proves the, permiss the impermissibility and the rule of being a homosexual in Islam. And you can't even imitate the opposite sex. So many people, they have a problem with this. And they say, well, what is the sin of the person who was born feminine? What is the sin of the, of the woman who is naturally a tomboy? She's naturally a tomboy. A man, a woman, they have children, they have four girls. Three of them are feminine, they're dainty, and one of them is naturally a tomboy. She fights with her brothers, she's athletic, she wears this type of clothes, that's how she is. She's not homosexual. What's her sin? 
The people that don't understand this Islamic principle are stifling, as we just said. Ammihi fi sadrika, yukhfihi. Half of the Hajar al-Tani explains this hadith by saying, is that if there's a person who's mukhannif, who's feminine, he's not necessarily cursed, and he's not necessarily a sinner, and he's not necessarily bad, unless he doesn't attempt to change and fight himself and stifle it and to suppress it. And he has to yet to kill left. He has to act like a man, even though that's not his normal character. And a woman who's masculine is upon her to make herself dangerous. So with that being said, we ask Allah to remove hasid from our hearts. We ask Allah to give us sincerity, ikhlas, for his face and for nothing else. We ask Allah to give us beneficial knowledge and increase us in righteous action and to make us patient upon the harms and the difficulties that we experience in the path of da'wah. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. If any of the mashaykh would like to comment or add, Wallahi, the floor is more than open. And if not, perhaps we'll take a few questions. Those who want to leave, you can leave. I know it's late. It's been a very long day for us. If you want to go, la haraj. No one's going to look at you funny. No one's going to be upset. No one's going to feel disrespected. It's not a problem. If you want to stay and ask questions or benefit, whatever, then marhaba. Jazakumullah khayr. Sayyidu Kushala, when you talk about the question, inshallah, you can raise your hand and the chef will pick as he, as he feels, inshallah. La la, I need to ask you the questions, Akhi. What, what is this? First introduction, now you. Come on, Akhi. Subhanallah. Anyone have any further, Akhi? Clear. With regards to having a hasan in your heart and suppressing it versus asking about it, getting some advice, asking someone learned and knowledgeable and experienced about how to get rid of it or what do you think? Do you think it's right? So on and so forth. Jazakallah khayyam. Before I answer the question, you brought up something I want to mention briefly. And that is, if you have a hasan for someone and you bring up some criticism against them, and I want to say this once and for all for the record, for all of those in attendance and those to hear, we have no problem with criticism. We welcome criticism, but with conditions. And the first, con the first condition is that the criticism has to be scientific. Naqt ilmi. Has to be based off of knowledge. As far as fulan and alan and this and that, we don't welcome that type of criticism. Wallahi, even if you are a hater and if you have jealousy or whatever, you can say we don't like you, nothing about it. And the criticism is factual and scientific, I will say thank you. Jazakallah khairan, shukran. Even if I disagree with you, if you bring criticism that's based off of something, I still would thank you. So for the people to know what I believe, and I believe that I speak on behalf of the brothers here as well, is nothing wrong with scientific criticism, knowledge-based criticism. That is a part of the deen. But the problem is, is that if you're making criticism of someone and you have hasad, whether they take your criticism or not, you still have to fix your situation. You still have a problem with the law subhanahu wa ta'ala on your qiyamah for having hasad. Are we understand this? So with, with regards to the question, there's, there's several ways we can answer the question. First and foremost is, the ulama of Islam have mentioned, it's nothing wrong with mentioning a sin or mentioning someone's name or even attacking someone's honor if there's a need. Seeking fatwa. Seeking shura or nasiha. And there's no way that you can be indirect. But you have to be blunt and specific. Who? What's the problem? I don't want to mention it. No, tell me, what's the problem? What's the issue? And he says, it's Muhammad ibn Munir. You know, I heard some things, I've seen some things, so on and so forth. And you know, I feel a certain type of way. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as it is necessity. As long as it's what? Necessity. As the Messenger of Allah <laughs> would do with us in certain situations. Sometimes he would say, Ma'abal ibn Jalib. Why do men do this? Why are people doing this? He wouldn't mention their names. And there's sometimes in which he would say it to the person's face. Are you a troublemaker, Mu'ad? Are you a troublemaker? Are you a troublemaker? Look at the beauty of this hadith. He asked Mu'ad, was he a troublemaker for leading the salah too long? 
What would the Prophet of Islam say if he heard some of our statements today? What type of troublemakers would we be labeled as? His only crime is that he recited a long surah in a salah. And he asked them, was he a troublemaker? Three times. Just imagine if the Prophet heard our khutbahs and our classes and read our social media. What would he say about us? What type of fatan would we be called? Think about this hadith now. But yet and still, he said it to Mu'adh's face. He didn't say it behind his back. Then there are other hadiths in which people came to the Prophet and mentioned names. And he gave them the fatwa. أَمَّا مُعَاوِيَةً فَسُعْلُكُنْ لَا مَالًا وَأَمَّا أَبُوْ جَهْمًا فَدَرَّابٌ لِلْنِسَاءٍ He says, Mu'awiyah has no money. Abu Jahm hits women. Mary Usama. So she mentioned names. And the Prophet entertained her question. And he answered the question and he mentioned Usama, a third name. So if it's a necessity, if it's a need, then there's nothing wrong with that. If there isn't a necessity and there isn't a need, there's no need to huh, attack the honor of a Muslim, even if the Muslim is wrong and sinful. All right? Last but not least is the statement that says, Yukhfihi aw ammihi fi sadrika. Okay, hide it in your chest, stifle it in your chest. I don't think that they meant just let it fester in your chest. They didn't mean that. Just cover it up with dirt. No, 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 no. But they, they, they mean work on it. Fight it. Ask Allah to remove it. Hate it. Huh? And at the same time, while you're working on it, cover it up. You understand? And in any circumstances, it mean just let it sit in your heart and fester. That's not, that's not the maqsood. As we just explained about the hadith of the men and women who imitate each other. Is that you have to fight it and hide it at the same time. So I have a problem smoking cigarettes. I just don't put the cigarette out, brush my teeth, put on cologne, chew some gum or some mints before I come to the masjid. But I'm working on dropping my cigarette addiction. But while I'm working on it, it may take a month or a year, I also need to do what? Hide it. I don't understand the difference. And it doesn't just mean just hide the jealousy in your heart. No, 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 no. But you have to work on it. Whether it's consulting someone, whether it's going up to the person, or whatever else you have to do to remove the hasad from your heart, and even if you can't remove it, it may be so strong, at least bury it. Wallahu hmm? alam. Khalas, tayyib, inshallah. Any questions from the sisters? Are there any sisters here? And if not, we will fadl. Or fikum. The beginning, student of knowledge, the beginning. The student of knowledge is the beginning. What should he or she be busy with? You should be busy with being a student of knowledge. Be busy with being a student of knowledge. And what is a student of knowledge except to study knowledge? Study knowledge. So you should be busy with ilm and only ilm. You shouldn't be busy with other things and other people. There were some of the ulama of the past, it was said about them, إِنَّ فُلَانًا أَعْلَمْ بِرِجَالِ الْحَدِيثِ مِنْ جِيرَانِهِ they said that this person knows more about the narrators of hadith than his own neighbors. He knows more of the narrators of hadith than the men who lived next to him and around him. He was naive. He was uh, oblivious. He was stupid. No. Meaning that his nose was always in the kutub of hadith more than in the noses of men and of people. And that's an alim. So if that's an alim, he, he's so busy with ilm, with hadith, he doesn't have time for this one and that one. What do you think about me and about you? So a student of knowledge should be busy with being a student of knowledge, studying knowledge. Obviously, first and foremost is al-ikhlas. After ikhlas is tashih wa niyyah. And tashih wa niyyah is not necessarily the same as ikhlas. Ikhlas is one thing. I study for Allah. Tashih wa niyyah is a bit different. That is, I would say, defining your purpose. Seeking knowledge to benefit people. Seeking knowledge to help yourself. Seeking knowledge to be a better member of your community. That's what's meant by tashih wa niyyah. Ikhlas and that are two different things. Because you can be sincere for Allah, but you can seek knowledge for the wrong reasons. Or you can seek knowledge for the wrong purpose or the wrong aspirations. So there are two different steps. Number three, try your best to perfect the reading of the Quran al Karim. Not its memorization, not its tafsir, not the ayat al hakam but the qira'ah and the tilawah. Having the proper recitation of the Quran. If you learn how to properly read the Qur'an, you can memorize it by yourself. 
And you can learn the improper recitation of the Quran and sit with a sheikh and still have a khata' in Allah. Is that not possible? It's possible. So learn how to read the Quran properly. Then, be the night time, start memorizing the Quran. Inshallah. Even if it takes you 10 years or 5 years or 20 years, but start on the journey. Then learn the Arabic language. Start learning basic conversation. How to express yourself. How to ask questions. How to communicate. And do not start off with grammar and morphology. Don't start off with nah, what's up? There is no ajr me in the beginning. You don't need that book. You need how to say hello. How to say, I want uh, this for dinner. How to say, where's the auto bus? Where's the bus stop? Where's the train station? That's the Arabic that you need to learn in the beginning. And also learn the afkar of the Prophet Learn the prophetic supplications. And the wisdom behind that, obviously, two main wisdoms. Wisdom number one is to strengthen your relationship with Allah. And as some of the Salaf Salaf, some of the Salaf Salaf will say, مَنْ طَلَبَ الْحَدِيثِ فَقَدْ طَلَبَ أَعْلَى الْأُمُورِ فَيَجِهُ أَنْ يَكُونَ خَيْرَ النَّاسِ He has to be the best of the people. And that's because he's seeking the best of the best. He's learning the best of the best, so he has to behave accordingly. So you have to have the strongest connection with the law out of all the people. Secondly, learning the adhkar teaches you the bread and the butter of talab al And that is repetition. And that's the magic of repetition. The magic of tikrar. When you memorize something, you go over it, you keep going over it, over and over again, the thing, quote unquote, magically sticks in your mind. Even though you didn't think you could do it, or it's too long, or it's too hard. But because you say it every day before you get dressed, every day before you eat, Every day before you go to sleep, every day before you wake up, it is what? Khalas. And that's why some of the ulama of hadith, they would say that, Inni la ahfadu nuskhat fulan kama ahfadu surahs of Fatiha. They would say, I know the hadiths of this companion like I know the Fatiha. How is that even possible? Except through strong memory, what? Repetition. And repeating the repeated. And that's what you learn through Afkar. Is that the more work you put in, and the more you repeat it, it's impossible to forget the knowledge. And that's more important than starting with this book, or that book, or this shaykh, or Quran Alam. And we said this earlier in the Humayr al-Masjid, is the mentality and the philosophy of a talib al And you have to learn that that is the bread and the butter. Mudhaqaratul ilmi hayatuhu. The life of ilm is revision. The life, the life blood, the thing that makes ilm pump is mudhaqara. And you can't learn that by just studying this one time and moving on to another book. So you have to be taught those values what? early on. So that's what you should be busy with as a student of knowledge. Once you've achieved uh, much, you've covered a lot of ground, move on to other sciences that your teacher advises you with. Wallahu alam. Zakallah khair. Any other questions, brothers? If not, we'll stop. Fadl. Fadl khair, Well, yeah, come. Few things, inshallah. Um, I spend a lot of time with you. Um, and uh, sometimes, I don't always hear the question from whoever's asking. Okay. So not criticism, but if you could repeat the question all the time, okay. then I'd always know what you're answering. Inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. That would be great. That's firstly. Secondly, a question. Um, I've heard some people talk about uh, riba in a way where they say the normal, uh, say the Hajj bin Mubit is, is fine to take. Okay. Because of the opinion that they have where they say the person doing the transaction to you is the one who's going to be held accountable for it, not the one who's being done to. Okay. I'm buying it, I'm having to go to the bank to get the mortgage, then it's not my fault that that's the system. Clear. Um, so just to get some clarification. Clear. Okay. Jazakallah khairan. With regards to riba, and how some people may say that the riba that you get from the financial institutions, the banks, the realtors, whatever the case may be, is okay. Because they're sinful for taking the riba, and you're not sinful for taking the benefit of the riba. Is that correct? So on and so forth. This is a very important question, and this is a well known issue to the people of knowledge. The ulama of Islam, from the early days up until now, they've agreed on many things, and they've differed on many things with regards to riba. All of the ulama don't agree on every single issue of riba, they differ on certain things. 
So that's, that's, that's nothing strange or weird. And if they differed back then, then of course a thousand years later, they're also going to differ because the world has changed. And things have changed. And economics and politics and things are very, 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 very different than in the second century or the third century. The time of Abu Hanifa is not 2019. Of course. The time of Ibn Hajab is not 2019. Things are very different. So that's nothing strange. So there are those who have different views and different opinions. But the advice that I would give, or before that, they differ on other things. Is it permissible to have riba and Dar al harb Is it permissible to have riba for the one who's taking to give? They differ on these issues. There's, there's khilaf on many of these issues. But my nasiha is the words of the Messenger of Allah, so the authentic hadith. لَعَنَ اللَّهُ أَكِلَ الرِّبَى وَمُمْكِلَهُ وَكَاتِبَهُ وَشَاهِدَيْهِ وَقَالَ هُمْ Lana, the Prophet said, he says that he who eats riba is cursed. وَمُمْكِلَهُ And he who gives it as food. وَكَاتِبَهُ The one who writes it down. وَشَاهِدَيْهِ And the two witnesses. And he said, هُمْ They're all equal. So that opinion, based off of that authentic hadith is baseless. In which the Prophet ﷺ discriminated not. The eater, the server, the witness, the watcher, kulluhum mal'unun. They're all cursed. Some of the ulama, they say, of the modern scholars, is that it's impermissible to work as a security guard in a bank. And some of them say it's impermissible to take training in a bank. And that's because you are a witness and a, a, a shahid to riba. You ever understand this? The problem, or not the problem, but the issue of any issue here will be of ta'ari for riba. What is riba? Is riba usury and interest? Or is riba just usury and not interest? Maybe a person could argue on that. And I never said that it's not haram. But I said a person could what? Perhaps argue on that. One could possibly say, usury is interest. La ta'kulu riba ad'afan mudu'afa. Usury, in which you're just breaking someone's back, taking their money, raping them with riba. As far as a small percentage of interest, giving or taking, which is unanimously accepted in the world today, a visa, master, etc. Some may say, it's nothing wrong with that. Or others may say, it's something wrong with it, but it's a necessity. All right? But the person who says that riba is only haram for the one who does it directly, la 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 la. There's 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 no way. There's no room there. I don't understand the point I'm trying to get to. The process of says that they are all equal. So that's what I was saying with regards to that. With regards to the other issues of riba, is it riba in the West? Is it a necessity to have a house? Is it haram to have a mortgage? Then that is an issue in which there's what a very long scholastic discussion. My words, I quote, a very long scholastic discussion. Not with ignorance, not with a full cup. I heard, I think, no, ilm. Huh? Of the sharia, ilm of the world and its economic system, and ilm of the maqasid al tashriya, the higher aims of legislation. Wallahu a'lam. Khayran, inshallah, we'll stop. Fadl, akhi. Walid, I'm sorry. Excuse me. I didn't forget about you, Walid. Malish, fadl. It's your question or no you you go ahead we'll eat fadl fadl what's the rule on getting hijama during ramadan i would advise to stay away from it unless you do it at night time only do the hijama at night that's the advice that i would give you as far as what the ulama of islam say regarding this issue then they differ some of them say hijama breaks the fast after al hajimu wal mahjum the one who's cupping the one who's receiving the cupping have broken their fast others say there is no iftar for the hajim or the mahjum and it's mansukh it's cancelled it used to be a ruling but it's no longer a ruling alright view number three are those who may say that hijama doesn't break the fast. It's something that leads to iftar 
because so much blood is being taken from you, and you become so weak and tired and exhausted, like sleep. Some would have said that sleep itself breaks wudu. And others, they, they say, Bal anom madhinnatul naqd. Madhinnatul intiqad. Madhinnatul hadith. They say that sleep doesn't break wudu. But sleep is the gateway to your wudu being broken. Because you're asleep, you're not aware of your senses, you may pass wind. Alright? So some of them might say that hijama breaks the wudu. Period. Others say it doesn't break the wudu. Period. And some say is that it's a means behind the wudu being broken because you're so weak and you're so what? Hot, light-headed or wherever you get the hijama. Al-Muhim, ala kulli hal, al-Nabi al-Nasahbi, the advice that we give, tabta'id an al-hijama, illa an tukun yani durura. You have to get it done. If you can wait until night, if you can wait to do it later on after the Qiyam, or if you can wait until after Ramadan, then that's best. That's the best thing to do. Wallahu a'lam. Fadl, ya khi. Clear, Walid? Fadl. Wa iyaakum. In regards to a student of Hadith, is it best to take the rulings from the early scholars or the later scholars? In general, the general rule is the earlier you go, the further you go back, the better it is. In all affairs of the deen. And it lies no doubt that we are very hypocritical. We just said this in the last masjid, unfortunately. They asked the question about takfir and the question of tabdir. People are so lax when it comes to tabdir. But they demonize anyone who brings up or mentions takfir. And that's a huge problem. That's a huge problem. Well, as we mentioned the reason behind these two things being connected. They're related. They're not the same, but they're related. So why is it such an easy, simple thing to make tabdir on someone and such a demonic, dangerous thing to make takfir on someone? Of course, one is of a higher level, but it's still min dabal asman wa can. So that's, that's hypocritical. Another point of hypocrisy that we have, unfortunately, is that we say the salaf when it comes to aqidah. The salaf never said this. The salaf never understood this. We believe in Allah's asma wa sifat amruha kama jat. This is what the salaf said about Allah's asma wa sifat and the ashaira, maturidi, fulan, fulan, fulan. They're all mubtadi'ah. The innovators did not from Ahl Sunnah because they didn't take the madhab al salaf, ha, fi talaqi, wa madhab al salaf fi fahmi hadi musus. Why the kalam sahih? It's true. But the same applies to the madhab of salaf when it comes to fiqh. If you say that there's ijma' on an issue, it's ijma'. But then you open up Musanaf Abdul Razak or Musanaf Ibn Abi Shayba, and you find Fulan, Sulaiman Ibn Isad, Hassan al Basri, Wa Qatada, Abdullah ibn Omar, well, all of them held that view. How are you going to say it's ijma' now? And how can you say you're following the salaf and this is the kalam of the salaf on this issue? So, fahm al salaf and fiqh. And fahm al salaf and akhlaq. Fahm al salaf when it comes to the rulers. And fahm al salaf when it comes to the ahadith. So many people, they only pick and choose what they want from the way of the salaf. And that's hypocritical and that's wrong. Point number one. Point number two is, why is there even a difference between the earlier scholars of hadith? What, does it, what difference does it make? Aren't they all scholars of hadith? What's the difference? But rather, the scholars who came later on, they may have a better stance in hadith because they saw everything from a distance. And we know that the worst thing that a general could do is lead from the front. The worst thing for a military commander is to lead his army from the front row. No matter how brave and courageous you are, that's a mistake. And that's because you cannot assess the entire battlefield from the front. You have to be at a distance where you can see everything developing. When to send in reinforcements, when to retreat, when, when, when. So the concept of the ulama who came in the 7th century and the 8th century, one could hypothetically say they are more accurate because they what? They saw things from a what? From a distance. The sunnah was compiled, the books were made, and they investigated everything. Ahmed, Bukhari, Tirmidhi, Muslim, they were on the front. One could possibly make that argument. However, if you look at the Islamic history, you know it's a well-known established fact that there were many things that took place in the 3rd, 4th, 5th, and 6th century. And there were many foreign influences on Islamic thought and on Islamic scholarship. And included in that is Hadith. Whether it is Usul al-Fiqh, whether it is Ahlul Kalam, 
the Mu'tazila, the Ashaira, the Maturidiyya, the Kullabiyya, whether it is the conquering of non-Muslims, of Muslim lands and Islamic lands and Muslim territories, there were many things that affected Islamic thought. And many things were changed and altered and many, many alien views entered upon the sciences of Islam, even the Arabic language. There were things that were put in dictionaries that the early grammarians never even knew about. The early ulama of the Lughal Arabiya, they never even heard of. The one who made this line of poetry, they don't even know who he was. All because of those different influences. And from that were the ulama of hadith. So when you read Nukhbat al-Fikr, you find Ahad, you find Mutawatir. Will you find Imam Ahmed mentioning the word Mutawatir? Will you find Imam al-Bukhari mentioning the word Ahad? Will you find him even saying, you feel the dhan, you feel the ilm al-yaqeen, al ilm al-yaqeen, bil qara'ni ala al muhtab Will you find him even bringing up these issues? Are those issues even from ulum al-Hadith? Al-Hafid ibn Hajar himself and Nuzat another, what does he say? about Ahad al-Mutawatir, laysa min mabahid al-Isnad. So the concept is, is that it's not about time. It's not about 8th century versus 3rd century, but it's about ideology. And there were some scholars who came later on, such as Ibn Rajab, or Ibn Abdul Hadi, and there were others who had the mentality of the earlier ulama of Hadith. Certain things the earlier scholars and later scholars agreed upon unanimously. There is no mutaqaddimin, mutaakhirin in this masala. They all agreed on this. And there are other things in which the ulama of the early centuries themselves ikhtalafu fi. And there are other things in which they agreed upon and it was only mentioned and argued over in the mutaakhirin. Alright? So before we get into who should we follow, whose ruling of hadith is better and more authentic, we have to let the soul of masala, haqqa tasawwur. We have to understand why is there even an issue. And what's meant by mutaqaddimin and mutaakhirin. And it's not just time, but it's ideology. Just like you have certain people who are young and they say, you're old school. You have an old soul and you're a young man. But the way you dress, the way you think, they say you're what? Old school. And you may have people who are old who want to look young. They want to go to the gym, they want to wear tight clothes, they want to be hip. And he's three times older than you. So it's not just based off of age. The next very important point is saying to return back to the early scholars of Hadith does not mean disrespecting the later scholars of Hadith. It does not necessitate a ta'an fihim, disrespecting Ibn Hajar and Al-Iraqi and Dhahbi or the scholars of today, Ahmed Shakir, Sheikh Al-Ghani. It doesn't mean disrespecting those scholars. And it doesn't mean that they didn't do anything for the deen and they didn't service the sunnah. La, abadan. We don't say that. If you differ with them, if you're qualified for that, that's one thing. But it doesn't mean that you disrespect them. And calling to go back to the earlier generations doesn't mean that the later generations have no contribution. No one will say about a fool what the ulama of Islam did in the 7th century. No way. Iraqi, Ibn Hajar, al dhahabi how would I khadim with deen, khadim with sunnah? They serve the deen. But it doesn't mean that every opinion, every view, every definition was pure and organic. That's very important to understand that point. So let's get to the actual answer to the question. What should the student of knowledge do? It depends on the student of knowledge. If you're a beginner, if you're a baby, then you take what's given to you. If you're advanced, you research and you look into it yourself. If you're in the middle, then you do a little bit of this. You mix and you match. This issue, I don't have the time to research. This issue is way above my head. But this issue, I can research. I can look into. All right? So it depends on the talib within. It depends on the issue. The general rule is that we always advise the people to go back to the earlier scholars. And once more, for the record, that does not mean that we are calling to the disrespect of the later scholars. It does not mean that Abidin. Rather, umirna and nunazila nasa manazilahum. As Aisha Rabbilana has quoted, have said, we were ordered to give the people their due rights. That's it. Doesn't mean that this one is bad because he's later and this one is good because he's earlier. You clear on this or not? So that's my advice with regards to the issue. Ilm al hadith, a part of it is theoretical, and a large part of it, the majority of it, is practical. So once you've learned a few basic books, and you have a good teacher, you need to start making tafrij. You need to start reading the shuru yourself. You need to start looking into the kutub al-rijal and the idal yourself. 
And practice makes perfect. No one is born an alim. The tallest tree was once, huh? Small thing being placed into the dirt. So that's my advice with regards to Ibn al-Hadith. Last but not least, the last thing I want to say is uh, a fatwa that I read some years ago from Sheikh Muhammad ibn Uthaymin rahimahullah. I'm sure many of the brothers have read this fatwa as well. The Sheikh was asked, can a student of knowledge make ijtihad? Or is ijtihad only for an alim? Sheikh ibn Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala, he clearly stated that there's nothing wrong with a student of knowledge making ijtihad as long as he has the qualifications to do that. And as long as he has the tools to do that. It doesn't mean that he's a mujtahid mutlaq. What alim today can say he's a mujtahid mutlaq? He's an absolute independent uh, jurist. Who can say that? Doesn't mean that. But a student of knowledge who has the ability to look and to investigate, Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin says he can. And an interesting part about this fatwa is Sheikh Ibn Uthaymin, he, he mentioned an example about why of the leather socks, al Masal of Fame. He says that not only can a student of knowledge make ijtihad, but he may make ijtihad and he may do an excellent job. And he may have tahqiq of someone who didn't have it, who came before him, who was an actual alim. So that's the point of advice to the people who say, a student of knowledge can't say this. A student of knowledge can't talk about this. A student of knowledge can't make ishtihad on that. Who said that? And you're claiming to follow the ulama from them chicken of Thaymeen. Wait, did you read this one? So the bottom line is knowledge. If you have the knowledge to do it, alim, talib, no difference. If you don't have the knowledge to do it, alim, talib, also makes no what? No difference. Allah says, don't approach that which you have no knowledge of. And that verse is not just for what? To laugh at him. That verse was given to Muhammad Don't go near that which you have no knowledge of. Meaning, if you do have knowledge of it, there's nothing wrong with you going near that thing. Wallahu alam. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah. As far as Imam al Ghazali, then he's one of the most famous and one of the most popular Islamic personalities. Someone that isn't just known by the Muslims, but he's known and respected by non Muslims. Was he a Sufi? Can we take from him? So on and so forth. Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah, he said, Abullahu an yatimma illa kitab. Shafi'i rahimahullah, he said, that Allah refuses for any book to be absolutely perfect except His. Allah refuses, Abullah. Allah would not allow a book to be absolutely perfect from cover to cover except for His book. And included in that statement of Shafi'i is Sahih Bukhari. And what up, Malik? A Sahih Muslim. And Aqid al Wasatiya. And this book, and that book, and that book. Because those are not the book of Allah. No matter how thorough a scholar is, there is going to be a mistake, or a slipping, or an error. Obviously, people differ in their levels of understanding. The Prophet, he said this himself. He says, maybe the one who gets the news understands it better than the one who heard the news. There's nothing wrong with that. People differ in their level of intelligence. They differ in their level of understanding. There's nothing wrong with that. Some scholars may make more mistakes than others. There's nothing wrong with that. No kidding. Go at it. However, the concept is that everything that this scholar says and does is good, and everything this scholar says and does is bad, that's what we reject. And that's what we warn from. So Imam al-Fazal is no different than any other scholar of Islam. He said things that were good, and he said things that weren't so good. Were there a lot of mistakes that Ghazali made? Was the Aqidah messed up so and so forth? That's beyond the point. The point is, he made beneficial works. And there are also errors, mistakes, and flaws of his work. Just like any other alim. But they're different levels. What's important is, there's no need to read the book of Imam al-Ghazali. You don't need Ihya al if you're a beginning student of knowledge. If you have to ask that question, you don't need. There's so much beneficial information which is simple, which is clean, which is right to the point on purifying the soul and the ilm al and the adab of the nafs. You don't need to. Talib al-ilm, different story. An expert, different story. An alim, different story. He can pick up Ihya al and take the many benefits in that book and leave off the things which are mistaken. It's just that what? That simple, okay? A baby, how does a baby eat? A baby eats baby food. 
a baby is spoon fed. A young child, two, three, four, what happened to that? People, they learn as they grow. You don't give a baby something that's too difficult. You give a baby something that's soft, sweet, and mushy. There's no bones, there's no skin, there's no nothing, just eat. And that is how you learn knowledge. The more you grow, the stronger you become, you have the ability to discern. And to pick up the book of Ghazali, take the khayr, and leave off the show. And the same applies to Fazal al-Amal. I said it then and I'll say it again. In any other what? Book. Besides the Quran. But if you have, why are you even asking about Fazal al-Amal? What's the point of you asking about the book? Have you read Fazal al-Amal? Why you need it? Why do you need it? Why? What's the mushkina that you have with that? You haven't read Sahih Bukhari once in your whole entire life. Let alone Sahih Muslim. Let alone Sunnah Nabi Dawood. How many hadiths have you memorized? There's no need for you to have a problem with Fazal al-Amal. Because you're not even going to pick up the book. I don't understand this or not. I don't understand. I, if, please make me understand. What's the problem? And the same applies to Al Ghazali. If you have to ask about him, then there's no need for you to what? Well, you don't have no place, no business in his what? In his books. Wallahu alam. Fadl Yaqi. Shaykh, you know you spoke about memorizing the Quran and learning the Arabic language. So when we give this advice to ourselves and our brothers, and specifically the youth, they respond, some may respond by saying, who said it's a condition to learn the Arabic language if you want to reject deviants or who they see as deviants? So what advice can you give to the youth? Right. Who said that it's a condition to learn the Arabic language? Khairan, inshallah. I don't think that a self-respecting student of knowledge would make that statement. Rather, I don't think that a self-respecting layman would make that statement. I don't think no one in their right mind would say something like that. If someone says, I want to be a student of Catholicism, I want to be a student of Christianity, and I say, well, you don't have to learn Latin, you don't have to speak Latin, you don't have to know nothing Latin, who said that you have to learn Latin? I don't think no one in their right mind would make any statement like that. I'm a, a, a scholar of Judaism. I want to be a scholar of the Torah, a scholar of the Talmud, and I know no Hebrew, no Yiddish, nothing whatsoever. Who, who would say, who would make a statement like that? You can't understand nothing about Jews and Judaism unless you learn it? No, different story. But I agree. You are totally stupid and ignorant of Islam if you don't know Arabic? No. But for you to be a scholar of Islam and to know the deen and have a thorough understanding of it, who in their right mouth said you don't have to learn the original language in which it was sent down? I don't think no one will say that. And I think that's someone who is lazy and lethargic and doesn't want to learn the Arabic language and they're trying to find an excuse or maybe even someone who has hasid. And Allah knows best. If they're not lazy and lethargic and they don't have hasid, then they're awfully mistaken. They're terribly mistaken. The Arabic language is of extreme importance to a Muslim, let alone a student of knowledge. How can you understand the words of your Lord in the Salat without the Arabic language? All right? Let alone the fact that we talk about da'wah, who to take from, who to, who to study from. I don't want to listen to this speaker. He's a deviant. He's this. He's that. He's so and he's so. One of the reasons is, is that you're taking from a translator. And you're at the mercy of a translator. But if you learn Arabic yourself, I read what Sheikh Ben Bass said about this issue. And it's far different than what you translated it as. Or these are the other ten factors that you didn't translate. So people are victimized oftentimes because they don't know what? They don't know Arabic. And the same applies to those who attack Islam. Most people who attack Islam and talk about Islam because there's a new breed of debaters nowadays. It's not like the past. No, there's a new trend of now they go on the offensive, as we saw today in Hyde Park and on YouTube. You ever notice that? 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it was a bit different. They would just make up lies about Islam. Everyone understand this? Or they would just propagate their way. So, much. But now, people are opening up Sayyid Bukhari. They're opening up the Quran and they're saying, look what your prophet said. Sayyid Bukhari, volume 2, hadith number such and such. Quran 12, 11, 26, 53. They're going on the offensive. Nine out of ten people who you find bringing these doubts about Islam with regards to black people, with regards to women, with regards to beating, whatever, terrorism, whatever the issue is that they're bringing up against Islam. The prophet killed all of the Jews, he committed a holocaust, he was a warmonger, so on and so forth. The messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa he said that I saw in my dream uh, there was a black woman leaving Medina. So that means the plague leaves Medina. So this is the prophet stands against black people. 
and the Prophet and so on. And that's, that's what they say. You can find this plain view on YouTube. Nine out of ten of them, if you sat down and asked them, how much Arabic do you know? Have you read this hadith in Arabic? Did you read this verse in Arabic? Nine out of ten of them say what? No. How can you be an expert critique or criticizer of a religion and you don't even know the language in which the religion was sent down? I don't think that would be accepted in academia. I think they would laugh at me if I went to the Vatican having an argument with them and I spoke English. Everyone understand this? If I went to Palestine and had a debate with Zionist scholars and everything has to be in English, do you think they would give me any respect? So Arabic language is of crucial importance to it. Wallahu alam. Father, if a person is sin, you will have to contribute to the mortgage uh, as the father asked me. If your father asks you to contribute to the mortgage and you believe that paying mortgage is haram, you're sinful. As long as you feel that it's impermissible to pay that mortgage and you pay to it, that's a sin. And if your father asks you to contribute, then it's upon you to try your best to convince him, to explain to him, and to plead with him. And if he doesn't want to take reason or he doesn't agree with you, don't contribute to it, even if he's angry with you. Wallahu alam. Right. Who is the Mujaddid? I've heard that the Mujaddid is the one who revives the Khilafah. And I've heard another interpretation that the Mujaddid is the one who just revives the Sunnah. And I have also heard that the Khilafah will be reestablished every 100 years in a hadith. Is this true? So on and so forth. The word Tajdeed has different meanings. It could be absolute tajdeed. It could be relative. It could be partial. A person may revive the study of hadith. A person may awaken the Muslims from their slumber with regards to Islamic politics. The khilafah or other than the khilafah. The tajdeed can mean many things. And in that hadith, in Allah yabathu li hadhiru ma ala rasi kulli miyati sana man yujadidu laha dinaha aw kama qal aw kama jaa. The hadith is says that Allah will send someone every 100 years who revives this deen. The Prophet never specified Khilafah or Ilm al-Hadith. He said, Men yujaddidu laha deenaha aw amr deenaha. That's what the Hadith says. He who revives the deen. Is Ilm al-Hadith from the deen? Of course. Is Khilafah from the deen? Of course. But it's not necessarily restricted to one thing without another. Clear on that? As far as the Khilafah being re-established every 100 years, then first and foremost, the ulama of Islam, they differ with regards to these types of hadiths. Every 100 years, what does that mean? That every 100 years there will be someone who is acknowledged by all to be the mujaddid? Or that there will be people who will make tajdeed of the deen? Whether they are acknowledged by all, or unknown, or whatever the case may be. Can there be more than one mujaddid at one time? Why well, give that? So there are many different interpretations and understandings of that hadith. What's important is, is ilm al-hadith is from the religion. And many people, as al Hafid bin Raja, he says, He says what? قَدْ تُوِيَ بِصَاطُهُ مُنْذُ أَزْمَانَ أَوْ قَالَ عَيْسَى الصَّلَامِ Oh, رَحِمَهُ الله. Ibn Raja, not the Prophet. He said that the science of hadith and its study has been abandoned a long time ago. And he died in the 8th century. What do you think about 2018? The 15th century. All right? The concept of the Khilafah. And Muslims having a Khalifa. And the obligation of having that. And establishing it and so on and so forth. We all know what's going on. We all see the world today. We all see what the non-Muslims say. And what the Munafiqun say. May Allah protect us from being Munafiqun. And what weak-minded, ignorant, sinful Muslims say. And what happens to people who wish to keep Islam orthodox. This is what it states. This is the delib. This is what we have to do. We all know what's happening in the world today. 
لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل والله أعلم. Any other questions, brothers? If not, we will start tonight. Jazakum Allah khairan. Allah surely knows best. Thank you very much for your time, for your attention, and for your respect. May Allah guide us to the straight path and keep us firm thereupon. My thanks to uh, all of my brothers, those who hosted us, uh, those who took us around, who drove us around, who fed us, who entertained us, who, who supported us in this second tour. Brother Nur al-Din, may Allah bless you. Give you the success with all good, brother Abu Isa, brother Muhammad, uh, our whole entire entourage, brother Abu Sa'id, brother Alameen, all of the brothers and the sisters who helped us out, all of the imams of the masjids, the different sheikhs that we met, all of the talab al ilm, all of the people who came to us and supported and showed love. We thank each and every one of you. And I also, and I'm not trying to be funny, but I also thank the people who are negative. The people who said bad things and negative things and warned from it and said don't say, we thank you. Wallahi, because we are indebted to you as well. Whereas hatred and hasad and negativity, we feed off of those things. And that's a means of encouragement. So I say shukran. Thank you to each and every person who had anything to do with the trip. Jazakumullah uh, khairan. I'm in your debt. I ask Allah to bless you, to reward you. And thank you very much for sacrificing the time with your family, your wife, your children. Uh, you work everything else that you left off just to make sure that we were okay and to make sure that the program was a success and it was my pleasure and it was my honor to come to the United Kingdom for a second time and to do what we do Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen